Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Nice, to, um, nice to see you this morning on a beautiful day. I'm, um, I'm looking forward to a, a new uh, term, this term. Robin's going to be leading us in a, a new series on explaining the gospel. So I think it's going to be exciting as we learn better how to um, explain the gospel um, to others. Can I read from Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse 28, just to focus ourselves and um, kind of yeah, get our head in the space that here we are meeting with the Almighty God. Hebrews 12, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Let me pray. Father, we give you thanks uh, for life, uh, for the fact that you have created us and and you sustain us. And yet, uh, as we reflect on that verse from Hebrews, we want to thank you particularly uh, for life eternal for the kingdom that cannot be shaken, that we receive through Jesus. Father, help us now to lift your name high. We pray that we might encourage one another as the morning goes on. Uh, help us to sit humbly under your word. Um, we pray that it might be a real blessing um, to each person here and, of course, a blessing to you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. We're going to start by singing his name. Praise.
promise we were waiting with our hope, with our life. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word. From a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. just joined us. Uh, Welcome again. It's lovely to uh, have you with us here this morning. Um, As I said before, we're going to be going on with a new series where Robin is going to be taking us through how to better explain uh, the gospel with people. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Right now, we've just um, sung to our King of Kings. We're going to come before him in a time of confession, acknowledging our holy God and our need to come before him um, in repentance. And so let's take a moment now just to uh, bring things uh, before him. And then we'll pray a prayer that will be appear on the screen. So let's just take a moment before God. Okay, let's pray. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge with shame the sins we have committed by thought, word and deed against your divine majesty. 
provoking your justly your wrath and indignation against us. We earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for all our misdoings. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past and grant that from this time forward we may serve and please you in newness of life to the honour and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so, of course, it's a fantastic thing. Jesus has risen from the dead. He's taken our sin upon himself, and we know we're forgiven in him. We read from Colossians chapter 2, uh, verses 13 to 14. When we were dead, we were dead in our sins and in the uncircumcision of our flesh. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Great news. Ian and Sharon can come and continue in prayer for us. Thanks, guys. As we continue to pray, we're going to focus on God's love. Um, we're told by John in the, his first letter, this is how God showed his love amongst us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we may live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your love in action. and We pray that we too may share that love that we know with those around us. We thank you for those amongst us who lovingly and sacrificially serve you and us all on Sundays and throughout the week. We pray that they may be filled with the joy of serving and may see the fruit of their work in changed lives. We pray, Lord, that you would stir us all up to share the gifts of service you've blessed us with as we join the many teams of volunteers in our church. Amen. Father, we give you great thanks for the provision of the many theological and ministry training colleges, colleges that teach the ministers of our diocese and beyond. We give thanks today for the faithful biblical, biblical teaching provided by Moore College, Youth Works, Sydney Missionary Bible College, Mary Andrews College and Ridley College. We praise you that we at All Saints have been blessed by faithful teachers and leaders whose training has taken place in these colleges. We pray for students currently preparing for ministry and mission, including Tim Cornford and those from All Saints planning to take up and study in the new year. We pray for all staff members of these colleges, that they would all be motivated by your love that they've experienced and that, that they would have a desire for others to come to the Saviour, in whose name we pray. Amen. Continuing in prayer, Father, we give you great thanks for bringing the Vonk family to live amongst us in Albion Park. We thank you for Robin as he leads, teaches and pastors us all. We thank you for his family who support and encourage him in his work here, especially Cathy and her loving and enthusiastic participation in the life of our church. We pray for Nathan, Samuel, Hannah, Elsie and Mary and ask that you would continue to grow them in their love for you. Amen. Thank you for the opportunity the women have to share breakfast together on the 30th of July and be encouraged by one another and from Leanne Cornford as she shares with us. We pray that you would be with Leanne and the organisers as they prepare this event. Amen. And loving Father, we all know the joys and sadnesses of living in this world. Today we pray for those who have been grieving the loss of loved ones during this year and continue to feel the pain of that loss. We especially pray for Marilyn, Tony and the family as they grieve the recent loss of Marilyn's mother. We ask that all who grieve may know you as the God of comfort and be encouraged and supported by those around them. Amen. I'm sure we've all seen some of the news reports on what's been happening in Sri Lanka. Um, we know that our Archbishop Kanishka Rathal is originally from Sri Lanka of Sri Lankan parents, and we know people in our church also have connections with Sri Lanka. Um, that's, that country has been undergoing great civil unrest, 
um, and minority groups are especially vulnerable during that time. Sri Lanka has a population that is 70% Buddhist, 20% Hindu and Muslim, and 10% Christian. Um, Christians are legally free to gather and worship, but they are pers a persecuted minority, um, even by government officials and even Buddhist monks who stir up um, persecution against them. Let's pray for our brothers and sisters in Sri Lanka. Father, we know that in spite of such opposition and hardship, Sri Lankan churches are strongly engaged in church planting and missionary activities. Father, we thank you for your people in Sri Lanka. We pray that you would sustain them during these times of desperation for the whole population, and especially as envy, opposition and persecution increase. We ask that you would continue to comfort our brothers and sisters and strengthen them, at them as they continue to share your saving message with all their neighbours and especially those who persecute them so that the love and power of Christ may be evident to all. We pray that salvation in Jesus may be boldly proclaimed throughout Sri Lanka and people are turned from darkness to his light and life of hope and joy through the witness of our faithful brothers and sisters in that country. We pray all these things for the honour and glory of Jesus. Amen. Thanks, guys. I note that um, Ian and Sharon uh, prayed for the bonks uh, during that little time, and um, I noticed on my fridge this morning, I just was I glanced at my fridge as I was getting my breakfast, um, my little fridge magnet said, please pray for the bonks as they join us on the 17th of July. I thought, wow, that's, that's a year. Um, so lovely to have you for the last year, guys. Uh, what a blessing you've been to us. So yeah, let's um, keep the uh, bonks always in our prayers, um, but what a blessing you've been to us. Thank you. Uh, our kids are going to uh, leave us for their programs now, so I'm just going to pray uh, for them and then they'll head out. Uh, our Father, Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the children uh, that meet with us in our church family. Uh, Father, we pray that as they head out now, that they might have a good time, but particularly, of course, that your spirit might be upon them as they learn about you. We pray they'll be growing closer and closer to Jesus. And we pray, of course, for their leaders to uh, for your spirit to be upon them as they teach, help them to teach. Uh, with wisdom and truth. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so all the kids go out. Just say a really quick hello to people around you and we'll be back really quickly. Okay, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, I'll see you people chatting there. Uh, really quickly, this coming week on Wednesday is the midweek service. Uh, it's 10.30 for morning tea or 11 and 11 for the service. Uh, so great if you can be there. If yourself or someone you know needs help with transport in getting there, then um, please speak to Natasha and she can help you with that sort of stuff. And uh, unless Kylie wanted to say something, I guess not. The women's breakfast is on this coming Saturday. It's this very coming Saturday. I know, that, I know the speaker is Leanne Cornford, and we know how much uh, we love and miss uh, both she and Tim. So it's a great chance to be encouraged by Leanne Cornford, uh, you ladies. But it's a last chance to register. So um, the registration is in the foyer. So please 
we want you uh, registered up apparently by um, by tomorrow. So if you need, if you haven't um, already done so, if you're here today, do that now. And if you're sick and at home watching online, but you're going to be able to be there on Saturday, um, give Kylie a call or an email or something. And Kylie, that's Kylie Williams, and Kylie will sort that out. Robin. Thanks, Paul. Good day, everyone. It's good to be with you today. I've got a couple of quick announcements for you. Firstly, um, if you were here two weeks ago, you'd remember that we spoke about serving in church and I had some serving forms. Um, I have to say, I wasn't exactly overwhelmed by responses on, on that particular occasion. I don't know if just the sermon wasn't that good or whatever, but um, I thought what I might do is I might have another pass at this. So um, if you have, uh, would like to serve in church or learn about different areas of church that you can um, use some of your gifts to serve in, uh, please do take, uh, it won't take very long, take some time to fill out one of these forms. The forms can be found inside the foyer on the bench there. So, uh, or you can also find it on the Facebook page. If you scroll down on our members page, you'll see it there too. Um, as you know, it takes a lot, of, a lot of people serving in many ways to keep our church going strong and smooth, so encourage me and fill out the form and I'll, someone will get back to you soon about how to, and for those of you who have filled out the forms, thank you so much for doing that um, we are getting to, to the point of collecting the data and, and getting back to you soon, so thanks for your patience there um, next announcement from me is uh, that on uh, uh, Thursday uh, the 4th of August, I believe it's a Thursday I don't have the information there in front of me, there we go, thank you, Thursday the 4th of August um, we're having a bit of a, a coffee and fundraising uh, night for the Southern Illawarra Schools Ministry Board. As you'll be well aware, um, our church supports um, paying high school uh, scripture teachers at Albion Park High School and Oak Flats High School. And we do that with a number of other churches in the area. And so on Thursday, the 4th of August, will be a chance for you to hear some stories about what's been happening in high school scripture from the two different teachers that we support as well as give you an opportunity to continue to support this uh, ministry in a new way. Uh, so that's going to be held at the Prezi Church just across the road, and I do hope that you'll be able to join us for that event. That's on Thursday the 4th of August. And finally, to let you know that we're continuing to um, raise money to sponsor Bibles for our church. We are in the middle of purchasing new Bibles for our church. Uh, we have begun that journey of raising the money, for that, it costs you $20 to sponsor a Bible, and I've actually got one of those Bibles here today with me, so you can see these are the ones that we're going to be having. Um, it would be wonderful if you would be able to consider sponsoring a new Bible for our church. To do so, um, please, um, you can either do that using the offertory box uh, in the foyer, just clearly mark anything that's going to the Bibles as for the Bibles or for sponsoring a Bible. And you can sponsor as many as you want to, $20 a Bible, or you can sponsor online using the normal electronic giving. Again, just in the description, make sure it's clear it's for sponsoring the Bibles. So far, we're 6% there, and I know we're going to go even further very soon. So um, thanks for listening, and I'll hand over to... Beck, and is, is Dan coming up? Just you, Beck. All right, no worries. Thanks, Beck. So the first reading is nice and easy. It's page number one, and it's Genesis 1, 1 to 31. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Sorry. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under, under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land. And the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. 
And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate day from light, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every living and moving thing with which the waters teem, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw that all he had made, and it was very good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. So the second reading is from um, Revelation 4.11, and it's on page 19.18 of the Pew Bible. It's a little one. (laughs) You are worthy, our Lord, our God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Thanks for reading that for us, uh, Beck. Good morning again, everyone. Now, I didn't get to say this before, but thank you so much for continuing to pray for us and our family. I didn't realise we'd been here a year, actually, um, but it has been such a delight to be with you over the past year, and we're looking forward to what's ahead. But even as we look toward the future, we continue to uh, need you to, to pray. And so please do, yeah, we'd, it'd be lovely if you would continue to pray for us and our family in this, but, yes, yeah, such a delightful church to be in where... Um, You so regularly and faithfully pray for us. We're very grateful um, for that. Let me pray for us all as we now spend the next bit of time considering God's Word together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are a God who has spoken, that you spoke creation into existence and that you've spoken to us through your Word that we have in front of us today. We thank you that you have not kept us in the darkness but you have given us the light of your truth. And we pray that this truth that comes from your word might settle our restless hearts this morning and give us peace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, some of you will be very happy to know that the Tour de France is coming to an end, not least because uh, you've, you've had enough of the cycling, but perhaps because you've had enough of my endless illustrations about the Tour de France. So don't worry, last weekend of the Tour de France, it'll be over after this. But it has been a long three weeks, uh, watching those cyclists endure those hills through the countryside of France. It's been hard for me to watch it, and I'm not even riding it. Uh, But you do learn a lot from watching uh, events like that. See, one of the things about the cyclists in in the Tour de France 
uh, that not everyone is aware of is that they have these radios that are attached to their ears. And so even as they're cycling for hours at a time, their radios are linked to their team directors who are following them in a, in a vehicle, in a car. And the team director gives them instructions on how they are to ride their race, right? So off now they're cycling, and the team director goes faster, faster, and they've got to keep going faster. And what it means is that the decisions that they take on the road are actually a response to what they're being told to do by their team director. Now, as, as Christians, we might not have radio earpieces, but we do have God's Word that instructs us, that instructs us on how, to, to, how we are to live, how we are to conduct ourselves. And one thing that we need to ask ourselves is, are we obedient to the instructions that God gives to us? Do we listen to the voice of the team director and chuck the earpiece away, figure we can do it on our own? Or are we active in obeying the Word of God in our life? So what kind of instructions does God have for us? Well, one of the most important instructions that Jesus gave to his followers was the instruction that they needed to be active in telling other people about him. Would you agree? Is that fair? Did not Jesus tell his disciples to go out into the world and make more disciples? This comes to us in the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, where followers of Jesus are commanded by Jesus to go out into the world to make new followers. And so generation after generation after generation of Christians have obeyed the word of God by taking the message of Jesus out into the world. We are to be advertisements for Christ wherever we go and ask people to join us as we follow him. Now, how are we going at doing this? I mean, this might be something that we might be aware of that we need to do. But actually doing it is something different entirely, is it not? Now, I, I, and as I speak with people, I find that most Christians, most people who follow the Lord, uh, do genuinely want to share their faith with others. Because why wouldn't you, right? It's the best news in the world. You know it, I know it. Um, to have peace with God, have the hope of an eternal life in heaven forever with one another. That's incredible. What, an, what a great announcement that is. I think Christians do genuinely, genuinely want to share this with others. But sometimes we're not always sure of what to say. Have you ever felt that? Maybe you got your tongue a little tired trying to explain why Jesus is important to you? I think some of the reasons why we struggle with sharing the news of Jesus with others is that we're not always sure how to move a conversation toward these kinds of spiritual things. It's easier to talk about, you know, the roundabout at Oak Flats, right? It's easier to talk about how much, how, you know how much rain we've had this year? Uh, it's easier to talk about those things. But to talk about things of great weight and importance, well, that takes something else. And we're not always sure how to steer a conversation in that direction. But another reason I think that we find it difficult is because Sometimes we're not even sure what the gospel is that we believe. We're not even sure what the gospel is that we believe. And this can be you. You can come to church. You might be here today. Uh, you come together, you sing, you pray, you say you believe in Jesus, and you do. You can know and do all these sorts of things, but it, it can, after a while, it can be a bit like using a calculator in, in, when you've forgotten your times tables. Um, See, more than ever, Christians, if we are to be faithful to the instruction that God has for us to go out into the world and to share the news of Jesus, more than ever, we need to not only believe, but to be able to explain it to other people. We need to be able to explain it. So what is the gospel and can you explain it? When people think of the, the word gospel, they might think, first of all, of uh, the first four books of the New Testament, the Gospel according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, and according to John. And uh, that would be a reasonable way to start, right? The Gospel is one of the books of the New Testament. Uh, but don't forget that even in those first four books of the New Testament, it's still the Gospel according to Matthew. What is the thing that they are referring to? Might be our next question. Well, what does the word Gospel mean? The word gospel simply means uh, news or an announcement. Someone's got an announcement to make. I mean, we know we have announcements in church every week. That could be like the gospel moment, but we know that it's not. 
But it is a very simple word. Someone has something to share. Not really a very spiritual word. But as Christians, when we use the word gospel, we are referring to not just any message, but the message that God has for us. And because it is a message that comes from God, it is good news for us to hear. So what's the gospel? What's the message? If I asked you, what is the gospel in one word, what might you say? Jesus? Jesus? Yep. Perhaps you might use that. And I'm just going to pause for a moment. And uh, in fact, what I'm going to do is, why don't you talk to the person next to you for a moment and say, what would the, how would you explain the gospel in three words? So just do that for me while we fix the technological thing here. Gospel in three words. All right, there you go. See, I can think on my feet too. That's all right. So one word, we might say Jesus. I'm just going to, before we get the next slide, no, anyone want to share what they had for three words? The Word of God. The Word of God, great. Any others? The life of Jesus. The life of Jesus, good. The road to salvation. Road to salvation, this is excellent. This is good. Okay, I came up with this one. <laughs> Jesus is Lord, all right? One word, Jesus. Three words, maybe. Jesus is the Lord. That's four words. Jesus is Lord. That's three. What about uh, ten words? I won't ask you to do that. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Is that reasonable? That's an explanation of the gospel in ten words. It's actually from the Bible, Acts 16, 31. So believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Are all of these accurate? They are, aren't they? We're... In some sense, they are all accurate because they all point us to the truth that God wants us to know. And in that sense, they are a bit like arcs in a circle, how each arc builds on the other. And each arc kind of implies the whole circle. So it's correct to say Jesus is the gospel or Jesus Lord is the gospel. That's what the Bible does. But if we want to get better at explaining the whole gospel message, then we need to know how to fill out the whole circle. And that's what I want to do in this series with you over the next six weeks. I want to be able to give you a way of explaining the gospel that has a fuller picture of the whole circle. That will give you more confidence when it comes to sharing the faith that you have and is important to you with other people in your life. And the framework we're going to do and look at over the next six weeks is called Two Ways to Live. Has anyone, is anyone familiar with the framework Two Ways to Live? Just put your hand up if that's you. Don't have to, I'm not going to ask you to come out and do it. A few of you? Okay, it's great. Um, it's about 20 years old now and uh, I did it many years ago as well and this year it's been re-released. And so it's a helpful opportunity for us to go back to it to see how we might be able to use it to explain the gospel. Now, it is an explanation that has six parts to it, and there are also diagrams to go with each of those six parts as well. So, as you come along each week, you'll see behind me in the frame a new diagram added. But if you want to see what they all are, you could just look at the track that you've been given today as well, and you can have a look at it in advance. So, what this means is that as we seek to build a bigger picture of the gospel, it's going to take us some time to go through it. And so I would like to encourage you to make sure that you come along for each of the six weeks so that you can join in with us as we do this. So each week we're going to consider one of the boxes of the two ways to live framework. 
each week does build on the one that comes before it. And in the sermons, what I'm going to do is I'm going to explore some of the major themes that are raised in each of these um, sections. So it won't just be me reading the framework. In fact, I'd encourage you to take this home and to spend your time reading it there. So today, we're going to look at week one, which is the picture that's given to us at the very beginning of the Bible and is reflected throughout Scripture, and that is that God is the good ruler and creator. We begin with that starting point, that God is the good ruler and creator. And I have two themes I want to pick up with you today. First of all, who is God? And secondly, who are we? So first, who is God? The first chapter of the Bible reveals to us the answer to one of life's biggest mysteries. Why are we here? You ever wondered that? Ever wondered that? Ever looked out at the night sky or just been wandering down the road and thought, who on earth am I and why am I here? I didn't ask to be here. Did you ask to be here? No, none of us did. Life is something that we just discovered, was given to us, and we inhabit. Why are we here? I uh, I noticed this week, I think it might have been the week before actually, some new images of the universe beaming back to us from the James Webb Telescope. Anyone seen them on the news? Aren't they incredible? Isn't it amazing to be able to peer into the depths of space Isn't absolutely gorgeous, actually, isn't it? To be able to see the creation in this new way. Never have we been able to peer into the universe like this before. What was blurry has become clear. We can see pictures of stars and galaxies like never before. The telescope that looks out into outer space shows us what is there. And it's remarkable. But the Bible tells us why it's there. And who's responsible for it? Why are we here? It's a question that we must know the answer to. And as we open up scriptures, the very first chapter of the Bible records for us the answer. Verse 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Do you want to know where all those galaxies came from? Do you all know who put those stars in the sky? It was God. God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. There was light. God saw the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. The darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. See, Genesis chapter 1 records for us a series of days where God creates new things simply by speaking. The universe exists because God spoke and called it into existence. And every day that we read about in Genesis reveals something more of God's creative work You look around and you see something new from the distant, most far-flung galaxies of the universe, from the stars and the planets, right down to the trees and the flowers and the plants, the animals, the creatures, the birds that roam and fly around the earth. Everything that we see, everything that is visible, is made by God. Now, it might surprise you, maybe it doesn't, to know that amongst, even amongst Christians there is disagreement about the details of how this chapter is put together. Some suggest that the seven days described here in Genesis chapter 1 are literal 24-hour days. Others suggest that the days that are being described here are more like symbolic literary devices rather than an actual seven-day week. Others suggest that they are seven days but each day is separated by a longer period of time. And these questions are absolutely worth exploring and delving into. However, for a simple gospel framework, which is what we're trying to do over the next six weeks, it might be a different approach for us as we look at this chapter might be to say, what is the minimum that we can draw about God from this chapter? What is the minimum that we can draw about God and us 
that the rest of the Bible agrees with. And there's plenty here for us to, that, we, that, that makes sense immediately. So first of all, what's the minimum this says about God? Well, we can simply say that God is, that God exists. And make no mistake, that's a monumental claim to make in this day and age, to say that God is. This is the claim that is made by the Bible in the very first chapter, that God exists. He is there and He exists beyond us. He's not created. He's not a part of the universe. He exists beyond the physical, the material realm in what we might describe as the supernatural or outside of nature. And yet, Christian belief in God sometimes is parodied by those who say that you know, God is maybe hiding out there in a distant galaxy beyond our eyes. And if we just look harder, we can find him peeking around a planet. It's said that when a, a Russian astronaut went up into space, um, you know, went from Earth to space, he came back and he reported to the authorities that he hadn't found God. And uh, I didn't know that he was actually there to be found, actually, in that way. Um, C.S. Lewis responded to this. He said that that would be like Hamlet going into the attic of the castle looking for Shakespeare. You know, the author is not to be found in the book. The painter is not found in the painting. The universe is God's creation. It is his work. But that's the claim being made here, that God simply is. He is there. The second thing we see about God here is that he is the creator and that means that when we see pictures coming back to us from things like the James Webb Telescope, as we look into the distant galaxies, we get to see, when we see it, we see the handiwork of God. That's what Genesis 1 is telling us. That when we go out into the country on a cold winter's night and we look up at the starry skies and we see the Milky Way galaxy, when we see that, we see the work of God. When we walk through our garden and we see the flowers budding from the leaves... We see the work of God. It is all his creation. God is the creator. Everything else is what he has made. Now at this point, um, someone might ask, and uh, scripture teachers in the room know exactly what I'm talking about, and they might say, well, if God made everything, the next question is, who made God? Yeah? Kids are instinctively get to this question, don't they? Kids do, they get it. Because they know something, they've learned something, that, that uh, they, they recognise something about cause and effect. If something exists, it's there because of something else. And so they know too well that if, if this is there, then it's only there because of that. And so when we say God made the world, instinctively they want to know, well, what made God? But the answer the Bible gives is that God didn't come from anywhere. He is not created. His existence depends on himself. And only things that are created are subject to cause and effect. See, to be created is to be contingent, to be dependent on something else that has come before you. That's the definition of what it means to be created. But if you're not created, then the question no longer applies. See, instead of who made God, we should ask, who is God? He is the eternal, supreme creator. And because he is the creator, he made us and we depend on him. And that is a truth that will have profound implications for our life. In fact, it will ultimately define our purpose and it defines the purpose of all that has been created. God is the creator and everything else is his creation. What else can we say of God from this chapter? Well, we can say um, that there is one God, can't we? We can say there's one God. Now, in other religions, you might sometimes hear of of many gods or multiple gods being, des being described in their views. And sometimes these multiple gods and multiple deities kind of vie for supremacy. They, they have conflict with one another and out of their conflict emerges the universe. Or they operate in separate domains of, the, of, the, of creation. So you have like a sea god and a sky god and so on. 
But that's not what we see in Genesis. In Genesis, there is one God. One God who is the creator over all things. But a sharp reader might notice the suggestion that there is more to it than that. Did you see it? See, by the time you get to God making human beings, you see a different pronoun is used. Verse 26, the God said, let us, see it? Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Has God gone woke? No. They, them, our? Has God changing his pronouns halfway through the first chapter? Well, no. But it is interesting that it is there, is it not? It's interesting that there is a change in the creation description when God makes human beings. Why is that? Why is that? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This language of our turns up in the Genesis account when the creation of human beings is described. And this might be the first hint that there is a complexity to the oneness of God. And as we see unfolded in the rest of Scripture, we see that God is Trinity in Father, Son and Spirit. But there is more time for us to explore that later. But notice the complexity that exists here. There is one God. What else can we say about God? Well, we can say that he made things good. Notice how every step of the way, God saw that he had made and he reported it as being good. God was pleased with what he had made. The universe gave him pleasure. He made it and it was good. So this is what we learn about God from this chapter. This picture of God who made all things, who stands outside creation and is our our own creator. What do we learn about ourselves? What do we learn about human beings? Well, I think that in our world today, we're very confused about what it means to be human. Many of us have differences of opinion about what a human being it is. We have, in some sense, an identity crisis in our world. The postmodern mood in which we inhabit tells us that the identity that we have is actually one which we select for ourselves. We choose our identity Is that a problem? Is it a problem to choose our identity? Well, it's a lot of pressure, isn't it? It's a lot of pressure. See, if your identity is what you define yourself to be, then that puts a monumental amount of weight upon all those choices that you make for yourself. See, in our world today, not only are you told to be whoever you want to be, but you're told to discover the perfect career for yourself, to find the perfect partner, to find a way to have it all, to travel the world, to be who you want to be. But we're also told that not only do we need to make these choices, but we can decide for ourselves if we want to be different from our physicality. So now we are told that our gender itself has been divorced from our biological structures. Our very identity is up for grabs. We quite literally can be whatever we want. Is that a good thing? Well, that's the world we live in. Some of the statistics that are out there suggest that we're not doing this very well, though. Let me give you some. I mean, it might be fine for you if you've already made the most significant decisions for your life. And chances are, if you're a little bit older, that is you. You've made the most significant decisions already. And so you've gone a long way into your journey. Your sense of yourself might be relatively secure. But what if you're just starting out on the journey of life and you're told to be whoever you want and your identity is the sum of your choices? What if you're just starting out? What about young people? How are they going at making a successful stab at constructing their identity. Well, a landmark study from the ABS just recently released suggests that we're not doing very well at all. That people aged between 16 and 24, that 40% have some sort of mental health condition, experiencing mental health struggles. 40%. Let that number sink in. It's worse for women. 46% for women, almost one in two. 
How well are we going at choosing our identity for ourselves if the effect is mental health struggles? Now, you might say that's not the effect. The effect is coming from something different. But I'll leave you to explore that data for yourself. The fact is that in this world where we are told we can be whoever we want to, apparently it's not making us feel much better about ourselves. You watch the television and you'll see ads on television prescribing all sorts of remedies to make yourself feel better about yourself. It doesn't seem to work. And that affects us into adulthood as well. Is it possible that the world in which we live in that says you can be whoever you want is not actually helping us construct the identity that we need? See, no one wants to ask why we're experiencing these problems in the first place. Is it possible that for many of us, choosing from any unlimited number of people who to date, to look within ourselves, to discover our gender, to be told that ultimately you are the sum of all your choices, that it actually might provide us with more harm than good? Is it possible that cutting the umbilical cord to God to find yourself floating in an empty and cold and mostly random universe that you found yourself in by chance, just dumb luck. Maybe that's the wrong way to think about yourself. Is it possible that the prospect of unlimited choices, which we are told will define our identity and success, ultimately lead not to fulfilment, but to despair? Because we're left wondering if the choices that we made were ever really the right ones for us to make. And there's no way of telling whether it was a right choice to begin with anyway. See, the philosophy and structure of our society that we live in today is now so fabricated on this idea. It's no wonder that even us who are Christians with a secure identity connected to God still find ourselves caught up in the cultural churn. The very fabric of our society is now built around this. And we are left in the turbulent wake. No. The Bible says our identity is far too precious to be bound to our choices. Now, our identity comes from God. It is independent of us. It comes from our relationship to Him. You are not actually an accident. Not some chancy, temporary collection of molecules that just so happens to be able to paint, build bridges mow lawns and fall in love. You are far more valuable than that. See, Genesis here, chapter 1, elevates human beings to the most unbelievably high level. Human beings are said to have been made in the very image of God. This is your identity. Verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In all of God's creation, only human beings are said to be made in the image of God. And what does that mean for us? Well, it means that there is a foundation to our identity that we did not create and we did not choose. You bear the mark of God in your body and in your soul. And that means it doesn't matter what you choose to do. It doesn't matter what you choose to deny. It doesn't matter who you date or who you divorce. It doesn't matter how much of a success your life might seem or how much of a mess you find yourself in. You are God's and you bear His image. And your value, dignity and worth comes from the one who created you and put on you his eternal seal. That is your identity. You are God's, and you bear his image. See, in the Bible, in this opening chapter, we have this most remarkable, unbending and unyielding link between the one who manufactured the cosmos out of nothing and you who sits here today. So what does this link look like? 
What does it mean for us to bear the image of God into the universe? How do we reflect God's image? I think there's a few things we can say about it. Firstly, notice that there is a responsibility that we have toward one another as fellow image bearers of God. When you look upon another human being, you are not just seeing a biological construction. You are seeing a fellow bearer of the image of God before your eyes. Whether you are fighting with that person, whether you are in love with that person, each person bears the image of God. Notice as well that this responsibility toward one another is reflected in our difference, in our distinctiveness as male and female. The human race's image-bearing of God is witnessed by their distinction. And that means, and this is actually seen amongst us in our physicality, every single one of the 40 trillion cells that make up your human body will describe whether you are male or female. Do you believe the science? It's there. It's a signature in every single one of your cells. And so we have a responsibility toward one another as male and female, made in God's image. But we also have a relationship to God as image bearers of Him. See, as image bearers of God, it means, first of all, that we are not ourselves God, that we are not divine that we don't have that responsibility. We can thank God for that. But with that responsibility, as an image bearer of God, to respond to God in the right way means that we must worship Him. And this is fundamental to the structure of creation. The creation must worship its creator. We see this at the back of the Bible, don't we? Revelation 4.11 describes it like this. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. Why? For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. See, the Bible positions us uniquely in the world. As the creation of God, we have a responsibility and obligation to worship our Creator. He is the one who made us and therefore is worthy of glory and honour and power. And that means that the more we see of the universe, the greater the glory that we see that is due to the creator of it all. What about our responsibility to the world around us? Well, did you notice this as well? That God actually gives to his image bearers a responsibility to rule over the world. We see that in verse 28, uh, that God gives us freedom to tend to the world and take care of it. God blessed them, verse 28, and said to them, "'Be fruitful and increase in number.'" Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And so there is a responsibility upon us as image bearers of God to take care of and tend to the world as the precious creation of God. And we could say more, but we'll leave it there. See, this opening picture of the Bible describes for us how God created things to be. This was His plan. And that's why... Even at this very opening point in exploring this gospel framework that we see good news because it pronounces a purpose upon our lives, a purpose that we do not need to create for ourselves but rather is given to us by a good and loving creator. See, this is what we see. At every point in God's creation, he remarks it was good, 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 very good. God made the world to have perfect harmony between him, himself, us and his creation. But is that the way we experience things today? So even as we read this chapter, our minds start to drift to the experience that we have in the world around us and we know that there's a problem. And as we shall see, the problem runs really deep. It runs really deep. But God as the good creator, as we shall see, not only leaves us to the problems that we experience but comes and rescues us and redeems and restores his creation through his son Jesus. But more on that in weeks to come. So let me encourage you over the next week, as we begin this adventure in learning this gospel framework together, to take some time to go through 
this gospel outline. I hope you found one of these inside your newsletters as you arrived. We do have spares in the foyer if you would like one. But consider how you might make the most out of these six weeks. Maybe you can learn the diagram. That's what we'll be doing with our children in our, house, in our house, in our home. Learn the diagram. Practice drawing the different elements in the box. You might have noticed that there's an empty box in the newsletter. That's for all you learners out there who have a pen in your hand. Practice drawing the, the diagrams. But I'd also like to encourage you to memorise a verse each week with me as well. Memorise a verse with me each week. And the verse for this week is Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. And next week, I'd like to have a volunteer to come to the front and share that verse in front of the rest of the church. So I'm not actually going to set that up in advance. So I'm actually going to be here next week and I'm going to ask for a volunteer to come up and recite the verse. And wouldn't it be a shame if no one came to the front? It'd be a shame, wouldn't it? Let's not have that happen. Let's take that responsibility upon ourselves to learn these verses so that we might have a better shot at explaining the gospel to the people around us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good news that you made us, that you are our creator, that you created all things, and that because of that we have purpose to our lives. We pray that this might give us peace as we live through turbulent times. And we pray together as a church that we might learn the gospel together and that you might grant to us opportunities to share the good news with other people. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again, so please stand, soak in and enjoy these first uh, few lines of this uh, next song. Soak them in.
Father, what wonderful words to sing, that boldly approach your eternal throne through Jesus. Um, we thank you for your love for us, that he would 
come and die as a ransom for us. Father, we thank you that it is so reassuring to know that we have our identity not in the many choices we make, but our identity simply because we were created and made by a sovereign God and, and made to be your image. So, Father, please, as we go out this week, help us to do that. Help us in every way we can uh, to seek to be your image to the people around us. Um, we pray that we might have opportunities to share uh, you with others, but we just pray that we might point people clearly to Jesus in our lives. Father, help us to be people of prayer. We thank you that you are sovereign. And so um, please help us to be people of, as, who pray as we head out to the day. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being here. Um, come and join some morning tea.